This is the Romans overview, and we left off in chapter 5. So also in chapter 5, you see the first Adam versus the last Adam. The first Adam brought sin into the world. The last Adam is Jesus Christ, and he brings everlasting life. Romans 5.10, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So he made peace. He is our propitiation. He took my hand. He took God's hand and brought them together. He, he reconciled us. He made us friends when we were enemies. Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The one man, as by one man sin entered into, in, entered into the world, the one man is Adam. He sinned by eating the fruit. Sin got in him, and he passed it on down to me. Sin entered the world through the first Adam. Sin causes death. But Jesus, the last Adam, through him comes everlasting life. Romans five thirteen and 14. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So Adam is a figure of Jesus Christ. He pictures him in many ways. But Jesus Christ is the last Adam. It says in Romans 5.15, but, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So through the offense of one, through the offense of one man, Adam, many people died in their sin. But by the death of Jesus Christ, who is the last Adam, many get a free gift of salvation. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So the first Adam brought sin and death. The last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, brought righteousness and eternal life. Now chapter 6. In this chapter, you'll, you'll see the spirit baptism, which has absolutely nothing to do with water. Look at Romans 6 and verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Just because we're saved by grace through faith without works doesn't mean, that doesn't mean we should just sin for the fun of it. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people say that. You know, they say, "You believe once saved, always saved." I hear, I hear people say it all the time. You believe once saved, always saved. People that believe that think they can just do whatever they want to. Well, no. Paul believed once saved, always saved. But he says this. He says, "What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Just because we're saved by grace through faith without works doesn't mean we should just sin and sin and sin." We are dead to sin. When you got born again, your spirit was made alive. And you, you, you need to live right and try to serve God every single second of your life. If you give in to sin, then you're letting a dead man control you. And that dead man is your flesh. It says in Romans 6, 3, and 4, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So this is referring to the spirit baptism. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. That is the spirit baptism. It has nothing to do with water, and it happened the moment that you got saved. Realizing that baptism doesn't always refer to water baptism will keep you out of a lot of false doctrine. The one baptism of Ephesians 4 is not water baptism. It's the spirit baptism. 
Ephesians 4, 4 through 5 says, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There is one baptism that saved you, and that is the spirit baptism, and you didn't even know what happened. It took place the moment that you believed the gospel, and at that moment you were baptized into the body of Christ. And that's the baptism that Paul mentions here in Romans 6, 3. You didn't even know what happened. So, how is there more than one baptism if Paul in Ephesians 4, 5 says there's one, one baptism? So, how is there more than one? Well, the same way Paul says there is one Lord. He says one Lord, one faith, one baptism. However, in 1 Corinthians 8, 5, Paul says there's God's many and Lord's many. So, is there a contradiction? Because Ephesians 4, 5 says there's one Lord. 1 Corinthians 8, 5 says there's Lord's many. Well, it's that there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. That's the main ones that saves a person. It doesn't mean they're the only ones. Obviously, there's more than one faith. You know that an evolutionist, he has his faith in evolution. Uh, a Buddhist has his faith in Buddha, I guess. A uh, Hindu has his faith in all kinds of gods. But there's one true faith, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's one true Lord, one true Lord that saves. And there's one baptism which saves. That's the spirit baptism, not the water baptism. There's actually more than one baptism in the Bible. But there's one baptism that saves a person. One main one. That's the spirit baptism. Now chapter 7. In chapter 7, Paul uses the illustration of a woman's husband dying so that she is free to marry another. Just like Ruth's husband died and she was free to marry Boaz. He does this illustration to show you what happened when you got saved. And when you got saved, your flesh was separated from your soul and your flesh died. You are free to marry another, the Lord Jesus Christ. So then if it says in Rome, uh, Romans 7, 3, So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to a man, another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. If a man has a husband who is still living, then she can't be married to another man, obviously. If she joins flesh with another man by stepping out on her husband and sleeping with another man, then she would be an adulteress. However, if her husband does, then she is, if her husband does die, then she's free to marry whom she will. Only in the Lord, only if he's saved. If her husband dies, you know, she can marry somebody else and it not be wrong. It says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So we become dead to the law so that we could be married to another, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul uses that illustration of, you know, if a woman is married and her husband's still alive, she can't be married to somebody else. But if he be dead, she is loose from that and she can she's free to remarry and i mean there's two other grounds for divorce and remarriage in the bible and that's if your husband deserted you you know that's not your fault you can you're free to remarry or if your uh, husband steps out on you uh, joins flesh with another person then you're free to divorce and remarry and it not be wrong but here in Romans 7, uh, Paul is using that illustration of when a, a husband dies, the woman is free to remarry. Just like when you get saved, you become dead to the law, you ju and you enter the body of Christ, you're, you, you, re you marry the Lord. He says in uh, Romans 7, 9, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, Sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. So before you reached what people call the age of accountability, you were alive without the law. If you have no knowledge that you're a sinner, like a child, he has no knowledge that he's a sinner. He has no, no understanding that he sinned against God. You know, he's safe. If he died in that state, then he would still go to heaven. But the moment that you realize you've sinned against God, 
you must be born again. So he says, I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So he reached that point. He reached that age or that time in his life. It, it, it's a different age for every person where he realized he was a sinner and that he sinned against God and then he had to be born again. He says in verse 11, For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. So the commandment is what makes sin seem sinful to you. It's what makes you realize that you've sinned against God. That's inspirationally what you what you got when you read the book of Romans. It lets you know that you've sinned against God. You're a sinner. You can't make it to heaven on your own. The Bible itself, reading it, the, uh, the commandments of the Bible will make sin seem sinful to you. If you've never read the Bible, then sin won't look like sin to you. It says in verse 17, Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I, for I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to, do, but how to perform that which is good I find not. So Paul says, nothing good dwells in your flesh, even after you get saved. Because Paul's saved here, and he says nothing in his flesh is good. His flesh is not the new creature. The new creature is in you if you're saved. When you get saved, you got two natures. You have the old man and you have the new man. The old man still wants to do the same sorry stuff that you did before you were saved. The new man wants to go by the scriptures. It says in verse 19, For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Paul says it is no more I that do it. It's the old man that does it. He's dead. He keeps popping up out of the grave and you have to shoot him back in. He says, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. It's the inward man. It's the new man. It's the new creature that delights in the law of God. It's not the flesh. The flesh wants to sleep in. The flesh wants to sleep in and eat Cheetos and binge watch Netflix filth all day. That's what the flesh wants to do. And you still have that sinful flesh. And it's possible for you to give in to that sinful flesh. And that's why many times it'll appear like a saved person is actually a lost person. Because, you know, the average person, uh, they're going to look at a person's outward works to determine if they're saved or not. That's what they're going to go by. Verse 23, it says, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So Paul calls this body a body of death. He refers to himself as a wretch. That's the old man. The old man still sins. The new man never sins. You see, that's the thing. People don't realize that. They think that when you get saved, your flesh gets born again too, but it doesn't. And that's why you can still sin after you get saved. It's the new man in you that doesn't sin. It's the new man in you that doesn't want to sin. It's the new man in you that God sees as righteous and holy as Jesus Christ. He doesn't see the flesh that way. You see, remember we talked about it's your flesh that's, that's waiting to be redeemed at the rapture. You see, if, if your flesh was good and, and it was holy, you know, like the holiness believe you can be sinlessly perfect. If that's true, then you wouldn't need new flesh. But you do need new flesh. You need a new body that you're going to get at the rapture. Now, chapter 8, you got the carnal mind versus the spiritual mind. Chapter 8, verse 11, it says, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the Lord, raised up Jesus, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, you shall die. 
But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. If you're going around living for the flesh, instead of living for the Spirit, then you're shaving time off your life. If you're going around being carnally minded, instead of being spiritually minded, you're just taking time off your life. Some some people may say, well, well, my papa, he lived like the devil all his life and he died at 90. Yeah, but if he would have got saved and lived right his entire life, he might have lived to be 110. Some people say, well, I knew a good Christian boy that died when he was 21. Well, what if he didn't get saved and live for the Lord? He might have died at the age of nine, for all you know. Just believe the Bible. Living for the flesh will shorten your lifespan. And the exceptions don't overthrow the rule. You know, how, why is it that all the things that the flesh desires many times just shave off your life? You know, fornication. Say that your flesh desires fornication. That's going to shorten your life. You're going to end up getting STDs. Or alcohol. Your flesh desires alcohol. That's not good for you. Your flesh desires cigarettes. That's not good for you. Your flesh desires all these things that that you put in your body all the time that aren't good for you. The, all the foods that's not good for you. And you, you're like a glutton, just constantly eating foods that's not good for you. You know, these things shorten your lifespan. You're living for the flesh. You're, you're, not, you're just concerned with making sure the flesh gets everything that it wants. And that's just sh shaving time off your life. Verse 15, for, if you've, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So the adoption has to do with when you get a new body at the rapture. That's also what chapter 8 is talking about. It's talking about when you get the new, your new body at the rapture. You're waiting for the adoption. So you already have been adopted spiritually speaking. Spir spiritually speaking, you're already the Son of God already since you've been saved but at the rapture you'll get a new body like the son of god so you 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 don't have a body like the son of god yet it's the new man in you that's like the son of god right now verse 23 says in romans 8 23 it says and not only they but ourselves also which have the first fruits of the spirit even we ourselves grown within ourselves waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body to wit means like that is to say so to break it down for you, we are waiting for the adoption, that is to say, the, the redemption of our body. Since you are adopted, you are in the family of God, and the Lord won't let go of his family. And here in this chapter, you have some of the greatest verses proving that he won't let his family go. And that is Romans eight, thirty-seven, and 38. It says, Nay, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that love is, is said to be in Christ Jesus. So you're not going to be separated from the love that's in Christ once you're saved. That's eternal security. Now in Romans 9, Paul is going to show you his heavy burden for lost people. He says in Romans 9, 3 through 4, For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. So notice Paul says he could wish himself accursed from Christ for his brethren. Talk about a burden for souls. He would go to hell himself if his brethren, the Jews, would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice they are his brethren according to the flesh, not the spirit. He's not talking about his brothers and sisters in Christ here. He says they are Israelites. Paul is a Jew. And this sets the context for the next three chapters, which talks about physical Jews, Jewish people, the ones that are Christ rejectors. Romans 10, look at Romans 10, it says, Brethren, Romans 10, 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and pray to God for Israel is 
that they might be saved. Notice the context again is not a spiritual Jew. It's uh, not the the spiritual seed of Abraham. It's because it, it, notice it says he wants Israel to be saved. This isn't referring to me and you because we're already saved. Why would he say my heart's desire and prayer to God for you is that you might be saved if, if he's talking to saved people here? And see, remember, it says, Paul says in Galatians, in Christ we're neither Jew nor Gentile. You know, he's, he's talking to physical Israel here. He says, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves under, to the righteousness of God. They're going about to establish their own righteousness. They're trying to earn their own way to heaven. They're trying to get to heaven by being circumcised and keeping the law. They go about to establish their own righteousness. So they never submitted themselves to God's righteousness, which only comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in verse 8, The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Salvation is about heart belief. And what a man has in his heart, he's most likely going to say it with his mouth as a general rule. So it says in verse 10, With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made into salvation. For example, the night I got saved, I believed from the heart. I knew the facts of the gospel. I knew that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins and that he was buried and resurrected. And I put my faith in that to save me. And most people, as a general rule, are going to say something with the mouth when they get saved. But that's not a sure thing. There are going to be times where... Maybe somebody doesn't say something with their mouth. Maybe they say it in their mind. Maybe they, maybe they made some outward, showed some outward evidence another way. Maybe they never opened their mouth, but they, they knew the facts of the gospel. They believed it from the heart, put their faith in the Lord, and they walked up to an altar. You know, some, some people show outward evidence in different ways of what took place inside. Some people teach that if a person didn't say anything with the mouth then they really didn't get saved. But you can't, you can't always say that because look at John 12, 42. It says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. They put their faith on Jesus, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. So many, many of those Jews believed that Jesus was who he said he was. They believed that he was the Son of God. But uh, they didn't confess him for fear of the Jews. So, I, But out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Most people are going to say something to the Lord with the mouth when they get saved. However, some people say something in their mind. Some people say something with the mouth. Some people just maybe got down on their knees. Some people may have just walked to an altar. You know, people do different things outwardly. But all that is is just outward evidence of what took place inside. For example, the night I got saved, I was alone. I talked to the Lord in my mind. I never even opened my mouth. So I, don't, I just don't make a big deal about that either way. You know, I'm not the type of person that's going to preach against a sinner's prayer. I like the sinner's prayer. I'm not the type of person that's going to just come out and say, you have to say something with the mouth when you get saved. Um, the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh so as a general rule most people are going to say something with their mouth when they get saved it says in verse 11 for the scripture saith whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved it is a whosoever will thing anybody can get in Christ God wants to dwell in you, and he wants you to be a member of the body of Christ. It says, how, they, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they hear? 
How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How would you call on him if you hadn't already believed in your heart to salvation? It says in verse 15, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So if you hadn't already believed in your heart to salvation, are you really even going to say it with your mouth sincerely to the Lord anyway? It's all about the heart belief. It's not about just believing facts in the mind. Remember that. You know, a lot of people believe that Jesus existed in history and that he died on the cross and was buried. And they may even believe he's resurrected, but you put your faith in that to save you. And the moment you do that, putting your faith in it to save you, you're believing from the heart and you're saved. In Romans 11, now you've got the great chapter on how Israel has fallen, but they will be restored. In Romans 11, 1, it says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Once again, he's talking about those Israelites. Paul is talking about his physical seed. And look at, look at how he says he's of the tribe of Benjamin. That is plain as the nose on your face that the context is not talking about the church. It's talking about physical Israel. Because there's a lot of people that's going to go through this chapter and say that this is talking about the church because they don't want to believe that Israel will be restored. But look what it says in Romans 11:25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, that you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Look at that. Look at the context of chapters 9, 10, and 11. You got Paul talking about physical Israel all through those three chapters. Over and over again, he shows you, proves to you that he's talking about physical Israel. He's not talking about the church. So how do people go to Romans eleven twenty five and not get that Israel, physical Israel, will be restored in the future. So it says blindness in part is happened to Israel. This isn't the church. It's Israel. Because they are blind to the truth right now. But there will be a believing remnant in the tribulation. They will go into the land. These are believing Jews. It isn't the apostate Jews. It's not some type of fake Jews. It's not Jews which say they are Jews and are not. As it talks about in Revelation, there's going to be a believing remnant. And it says in Romans eleven twenty six, And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. If this is referring to the church, then why does it say, And so all Israel shall be saved? If Israel is the church, then why does it say, We shall be saved? The church is already saved. He's going to turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Are you Jacob? Absolutely not. The idea that the church has replaced Israel makes absolutely no sense in light of Romans 9, 10, and 11. It says in Romans eleven twenty seven, 27, For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. If you're saved, you're already, your sins are already taken away. How could this be talking about me? It says in Romans eleven twenty eight, As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. So Israel are enemies concerning the gospel. That's obvious. They don't even believe Jesus Christ is God. That's not the church. The church is not an enemy of the gospel. It's present day Israel are enemies to the gospel. They are blind in part. And they have been since Acts chapter 7. They're blind. One day there will be a believing remnant. You see, in Acts chapter 7, they stoned Stephen, and that was like their final rejection. And then God started dealing with us, the church, the Gentiles. They're still Jews getting saved. This doesn't mean a Jew can't get saved today. They're still Jews getting saved. But as a whole, Israel is blind when it comes to the gospel. 
And God is not giving the land to unbelieving Jews. That's foolish. I heard a replacement theology guy the other day say, why would God give the land to a bunch of people that don't even believe Jesus Christ is God? And that shows me these people are foolish when it comes to this doctrine. The Jews that go into the land are going to be believing Jews, not unbelieving Jews or apostate Jews or fake Jews that are unbelievers. It says in Romans eleven twenty nine, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God didn't just promise it to Abraham, but to Isaac and Jacob and his sons. Me and you are children of Abraham by faith, but we aren't the physical seed of Abraham. Romans eleven thirty three. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. They are especially hard to find out when you can't tell the difference between Israel and the church like the replacement theology guys. Romans eleven thirty four through 35. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? Nobody knows more than the Lord, no matter how much they think they do, no matter how many times they try to correct the Bible. There is no way we can fully comprehend the mind of the Lord. The Bible is God giving you a piece of his mind.